Alright, today is Sunday, March 21st, and this is a recap for the market activities during last week and outlook for the upcoming week. The main event this past week was the FOMC meeting and the decision from the Federal Reserve regarding their forward guidance. And we know that we got nothing new. More of the same, the Federal Reserve being comfortable of where inflation is according to their formula. And they continue to believe that inflation has to average around 2%. And of course, they don't have any formula that dictates the decision making. And instead, they will eyeball inflation and they are telling us to rest assured that nothing will go out of control because even if things go out of control regarding inflation, the Federal Reserve has the tools to deal with it. In addition, the Federal Reserve affirmed that they will not end the bond purchasing program or increase interest rates until at least 20 23. Initially, the algos liked the decision from the Federal Reserve and we saw stocks riding higher. But immediately, rationale took over the very next day and we saw the bond vigilantes expressing their dismay and dissatisfaction with the statements and the decisions from the Federal Reserve and they continued to dump bonds, sending yields higher. The other important take that we got this past week is the Federal Reserve ending the SLR exemption for banks now how would that impact the current trajectory of yields will we see banks dumping treasuries or not and how would that impact the repo market because there is another crisis brewing in the repo market and we have to pay attention to the repo market now as far as this upcoming week we have two dynamics here we have the portfolio rebalancing for the second quarter from the big fund managers. Will they start buying bonds? How much? And will that be enough to offset the tsunami of selling that is going on right now by the bond vigilantes and a potential of more selling as an outcome of ending the SLR exemption? And the other dynamic we're looking forward to is the stimulus money. The stimulus checks already arrived and perhaps they will start hitting brokerage accounts this upcoming week. How will that impact the market? For now, the assumption is the retail traders will do the same thing they've been doing since last year. Buying the dip in speculative names, buying call options, and that should help the stock market to ride higher. The unknown remains how conservative the retail trader will be, meaning they might have the cash ready in their brokerage account, but they might not deploy the money to buy the dip because they're waiting for a better entry opportunity. That dynamic remains the wild card. Furthermore, even if we see the tsunami of stimulus money invading the market this week, will it again offset the tsunami of bond selling which will pressure yields higher and in turn algos will start selling growth and momentum stocks. So you have two opposing dynamics here. The stimulus money pushing stocks to the upside along with the portfolio rebalancing which we assume the fund management managers will have to buy some bonds to rebalance their portfolios. These two tailwinds pushing stocks higher. That is the assumption. But they are colliding with another important dynamic that has been dominating the market for the last few weeks, which is adding downward pressure on stocks. And that factor is the tsunami of bond dumping from the vigilantes and the likes. So we have the two opposing forces and the winner force will dictate where the stock market will trade this upcoming week. We will talk about that and a lot more during our coverage in the headlines of the day segment and we will talk about it a little more during the charts analysis. But for now, I got a market to cover and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down by 234.33 points or a decline of 0.71%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 99.07 points or a gain of 0.76%. The S&P 500 closing in the red by 2.36 points or a decline of 0. 0.06%. And what about the sector's performance on Friday? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, consumer cyclicals. At number two, capturing the silver medal, healthcare. And at number three for the bronze, communication services. The laggards of the day on Friday's session, led by financials, real estate, and industrials. Let's contrast that with the weekly picture. Pathetic performance across the board, only consumer defensives and healthcare 
barely managed to close in the green. But the decliners led by energy, materials, and financials. So we're seeing weakness here in the inflationary trade, meaning that we are starting to see profit taking from the winners energy financials materials and the question is will that be deployed to buy the dip in the beaten down technology names or what is the plan here for market participants are they just going to hold cash that is unforeseeable and the rational conclusion is that we are heading to start a new quarter we have plenty of uh, portfolio rebalancing going on from fund managers so they're taking money out of the winners and the assumption is that they will start to rebalance their portfolios we don't know how the rebalancing will take shape because we don't have access to these portfolios and we don't have access to the strategies of these fund managers. What are they looking for? But we know that the consensus is that the inflationary trade will continue to outperform because the outlook for yields remains higher. But will they in the short term buy some technology names, add to their positions in the beaten down names? Will they buy bonds? That remains to be seen. For now, we're not going to make any assumption regarding the action that we we saw this week. The outlook for me remains that the dip in financials, energy, materials, it is worthy of buying, meaning that we should be buying the dips in the inflationary trade and fading the rips in technology until and unless the Federal Reserve enact a policy regarding the rise of Treasury yields. Absent of that, the outlook remains the same, at least from my end. Moving on to the futures market performance. On Friday, what do we see here? We saw a rebound in crude oil. And once again, this is an illustration of the consensus that energy prices, crude prices specifically, will continue to surge higher because of the outlook of inflation. And therefore, you saw the activities in the options market buying the dip in energy names right away. I like to wait for the sell-off, the profit-taking, whatever it is, to take its course before buying the dips. What do we have here in softs? Lumbar was the only gainer in softs futures during Friday's session, closing in the green by the tune of 4%. But we saw declines led by coca, coffee, OJ, sugar, and cotton futures. What about metals? Muted activities for both silver and copper. We saw modest gains for gold, about half a percentage point or so. Meanwhile, declines sizable declines for both platinum and palladium and what about meats feeder cattle giving up some of the gains from the previous session meanwhile we saw live cattle with modest declines and lean hogs closing pretty much flat what about grains we saw muted activities in the dollar index on friday's session and right away you saw grains rebounding higher gains across the board whether we're talking about soybeans soybean meal soybean oil corn rough rice oats canola all closing in the green the laggard in grain session on friday were wheat futures down slightly by a little over half a percentage point the outlook for futures remains the same we continue to buy the dips in lumber copper corn soybeans because the outlook remains favorable to higher inflation <laughs> moving on to the options market the big casino Let's see what happened on Friday. We are, of course, anticipating the arrival of the STEMI cash. This is the assumption, no guarantees, to spike up the volume in the options market. We're not seeing that yet, but the assumption is, once again, it is an assumption that next week we will start to see a spike higher in options volume. But until then, this is what we got on Friday. At number one, Apple, with about 1.8 million contracts, about 64% of those were calls. And at number two, Facebook, with about 900,000 contracts, about 67% of those were calls. And at number three, Tesla, with a little over 750,000 contracts, about 52% of those were calls. And once again, everybody's asking, what will retail traders buy with their new STEMI money? The answer is call options on the popular names. You're seeing two of them on the screen right now at least we know tesla is one of them but tesla is a little more expensive you have neo neo has been stealing the thunder from tesla because option traders found out that they could experience the same moves the same gains they get from tesla in neo stock but the entry price to trade neo options 
is more accessible than Tesla options. Furthermore, we have Palantir, AMC, all of these names, assuming that the retail trader will do as expected. These are the names that will catch a bit. Palantir, AMC, NEO, Plug Power, etc. The question is, Will that be enough to create a rally in the stock market where these stimmy options traders will be rewarded? Or will we see the stimmy money sinkhole opening up? And that would happen if we continue to see yields surging higher. In the grand schemes of things, the stimmy money and the rebalancing will add about 100 billion or so between stocks, bonds, and options. It's a simple mathematical formula. Is a little over 100 billion offsetting to whatever amount of bonds dumping. We know the banks dumped about 80 billion dollars of bonds last week. So all of you who are optimistic about a stimmy rally, you better hope that the bond vigilantes will take a break next week from bonds dumping. And you better hope that the SLR exemption expiration will not result in more bonds dumping by banks. And then you have your stimmy rally. For now, we're moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday, starting with the ticker FB for Facebook. You know, Facebook has been outperforming the technology sector, even though we're seeing massive sell-off taking place. And the question is, why is that? Why is Facebook outperforming? Perhaps I got the answer for you during the heat map analysis. But for now, here is the trade. And they are betting on more gains for Facebook by buying the 305 calls expiration date April 1st with expectations that Facebook will gain an additional 5% or more by the expiration date. They paid about 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade, which brought the total all the way to $3 million. What about the ticker WSM for William Sonoma? We know that the name popped higher after earnings. How could it not? Because a business like William Sonoma is positioned to exploit this environment tremendously, meaning that the rich and the upper class in our society have more disposable income than ever, and therefore a business that caters to them, such as William Sonoma, will benefit tremendously. And the earnings report was very, very decent. But somebody's fading the pop here, betting on profit taking to take place by buying the 150 puts expiration date April 16th with expectations that William Sonoma will decline over 14% by then. They paid about a buck and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, bringing the total all the way to $1.7 million. What about the trade at the bottom of the table for the ticker TLT? This is for the 10-year treasury bonds and beyond, the long end of the treasury curve. We know that there is a massive sell-off going on in the bonds market, pushing prices down and yields higher. It's an inverse relationship. And somebody's betting on more pain to come here for the TLT, betting on more selling of bonds by buying the 126 puts expiration date May 21st, with expectations that the TLT will decline over 6.5% by then, and they paid about a buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade, bringing the total all the way to $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker SPG? This is for Simon Properties. If you're betting on a reopening, perhaps you're betting on the revival of malls, whatever that is. At least this trader is doing so by buying the 130 calls expiration date May 21st, with expectations that the name will gain over 11% by then, and they paid about 3 bucks and 60 cents a piece to enter this trade, bringing the total all the way to $2.3 million. Now, the the only thing you have to be worried about when you are buying businesses like Simon Properties and Macy's, all that garbage, because you're betting on a reopening, even cruises by the way. Be careful if yields continue to surge out of control, because these are zombie companies that are highly leveraged and in the scenario of yields exploding higher, which is very plausible by the way, I'll show you in a little bit, these businesses will get hurt significantly and some of them might even go the route of bankruptcy and therefore I'm writing a list of the so-called reopening names that happen to be zombie companies at the same time and I'm watching them very closely here eyeing entries for short positions in these names because if we continue to see yields rising higher you can talk about yields are rising for the good reasons all you want you can talk about the reopening and the splurging all you want that will benefit these stocks and these companies granted but some of these stocks have already surpassed their pre-pandemic highs now they are in a worse position 
financially speaking, than before because they're highly leveraged. And a rise in interest rates will bring the house of cards crumbling down. Moving on to the ticker PTON, Peloton. You know, Kathy Wood of ARK Invest is on a gambling spree and she is dumping her winners to fund her losers, buying the dips in names like Tesla, Teladoc, and now she's buying the dip in Peloton, a name that thrived under the stay-at-home environment. We know we are heading into the reopening phase, which means that rationally you should fade Peloton. In addition, the name is highly overvalued, meaning that it is a target of this current wave of yields rising higher. But in this case, somebody's following Kathy Wood by buying Peloton calls, specifically the 122 expiring April 1st, with expectations that Peloton will rise over 12.5% by then. And they paid about one buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade, which brought the total all the way to a little over $550,000. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker XME? And this is for the materials ETF. We know we saw some declines here in the XME, but the dips are to buy in materials, given the inflationary outlook and somebody's doing that right away by buying the dip in the xme specifically the 42 calls expiration date april 16th with expectations that the name will gain over five and a half percent by then they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade bringing the total all the way to four hundred thousand dollars Moving on to the headlines that shape the day starting with macro news the story of the day, the story of the week is the end of the bull market in bonds. And here is the headline. Treasury's bull market that began in 1981 has finally ended. And we have indeed tipped into a bear market in bonds. The definition of a bear market is when something falls over 20% or so from the peak. Well, this month we witnessed over 20% declines from the peak in the treasury market. And therefore, we have officially entered a bear market in bonds. And the question is that after you dip into a bear market territory, you usually have massive bounces. They're called bear market rallies. And we will see plenty of those in the TLT in bonds but all in all, the bull run that has been going on for about 40 years is over now. So in this channel, when we talk about a seismic shift in the macro outlook in the market landscape, we are talking about this shift that we have not seen or experienced for about 40 years. And many fund managers and investors alike are not accustomed to this kind of change because they haven't experienced it before. And therefore, we are in uncharted territory. But we can use historical references and common sense to navigate our way in this very difficult terrain. All in all, the easy era of investing, picking a technology stock out of a hat and reaping the rewards, or parking your money in an ETF, aka the lazy style investing, was rewarding. Now we are moving into a market that requires more work, that requires stock picking when you are picking stocks you have to do the work the financial analysis the ratio analysis technical analysis reading balance sheets reading corporate earnings and then making your decisions because not every business will be treated alike in this environment that we are heading to and once again why are yields rising higher they're rising higher due to the rise of inflation expectations. Matter of fact, inflation expectations surged to a 12-year high. And you see that very steep, sharp move higher in inflation expectations. We haven't seen this kind of move before since the aftermath of the financial crisis. The difference is that during the financial crisis, the recovery of the financial crisis, the move happened from negative inflation expectations to slightly positive. This time around, we're moving from positive to more positive, meaning expecting more inflation. And if this is the trajectory, then we will surpass multi-decade highs of inflation expectations. And here is another important take. The spread between the 10-year and 5-year Treasury break-even rates has never been this negative. And pay attention here, because the last time we saw this kind of decline, that coincided with the financial crisis of 08-09. And before that, 
the end of the dark calm bubble. So looking at this indicator alone, it should be a solid signal that the current mania, the bubble in the stock market is coming to an end. If it hasn't ended already, unless if this rise in inflation expectations is premature and overdone. And this is the argument from the deflationary crowd. But here is the truth about inflation. We're seeing inflation happening in pretty much every commodity, every product, from semiconductors, headphones, plastic, steel, aluminum, coolers, furniture, boats, seafood, meat, cheese, even roller skates. And some of these products and commodities, the shortage that is, can be mitigated via an increase in supply. The challenge here is that demand surged way higher and faster than the supply can catch up with due to the tsunami of liquidity. People have more cash and that cash is chasing the very same products. This is classic inflation. Demand rises higher, supply is caught by surprise, and you see inflationary pressures. Now, in time, supply could mitigate the shortages in some of these products. But in other cases, that is pretty much impossible to happen. And inflation in these specific commodities and products will continue to surge higher because the inflation in these particular products was a result of monetary inflation, not classic inflation, as you can see with fitness equipments, roller skates, etc. That is very different from, say, copper, because here is what's going on with copper. The world may soon face a massive shortfall, 10 million tons if no new mines get built, what is arguably the most critical metal for global economies, copper. Once again, to all the deflationary crowd out there, you're not going to be able to print copper. You're not going to be able to dig copper out of the ground very quickly, meaning that the inflationary pressure in copper, platinum, lumber, grains, that will continue to spike higher because you're not in a video game. You can't just create more corn or more lumber and you build your empire. Once there is a shortage, the natural course is prices will continue to surge higher and higher. And this is all a result of the monetary policies of central banks of flooding the system of unneeded liquidity. And what about crude oil? Here it is from Goldman Sachs. Goldman sees oil price pull back as a buying opportunity, meaning they're saying that whatever sell-off that took place on the market on Thursday, that is a buying opportunity because the long-term trajectory for energy prices is higher. And that leads us to the very important decision that the Federal Reserve took on Friday. Before the decision took place, we saw certain phenomenons taking place, and these were indicators to what is about to come. Number one, we saw the biggest drop, daily drop that is, in the Treasury cash balance. We saw a massive withdrawal of about $271 billion in one day. And then, here it is, the New York Federal Reserve reverse repo facility saw a massive spike of about $27 billion. And that was the hint right there that the SLR exemption for banks is about to expire and the Federal Reserve will not renew the exemption. Remember that Papa Jerome, during his press conference, when asked about the extension of the exemption of SLR, Jerome Powell did not want to talk about it right then because on one hand, Jerome was reassuring the market that the Federal Reserve's easy policy, the dovish outlook, is still here and the Federal Reserve is not thinking about thinking about thinking about tapering the bond purchases program program or raising interest rates. And if they have to raise interest rates or taper the bond purchasing program, oh how generous of them, they will let us know in advance. So Jerome did not want to have contradictory messages by saying we're going to do the easy policy, but at the same time, we're also ending the easy policy when it comes to the SLR exemptions. Victoria, um, we'll have something to announce on that in coming days. And uh, I'm not going to expound upon your questions. I'll, why don't you why don't you ask another question if you'd like to? Because because that one I'm just going to say that we're something in coming days. Good morning, John. The Federal Reserve is letting the supplementary leverage ratio exemption it granted to banks expire as uh, planned on March 31st. Now, the banks who have over $250 billion in assets must hold 3% of their leverage exposure in Tier 1 capital, which generally means equity. The biggest banks, the GSIBs, the eight of those, they have to hold 5%. 
The leveraged assets are not risk-weighted. They include treasuries and reserves held at the Fed, the rules put in place after the financial crisis to ensure banks would have enough capital to offset potential crisis losses. Now, what happened during the crisis is the government issued billions in pandemic relief checks and the Treasury Department sold hundreds of billions in bonds to help pay for the relief efforts. Much of the proceeds then end up in banks as deposits, which increase their exposure to the leverage ratio, and they would have to raise the capital that they held, whether they wanted to or not. So last April, the Fed exempted the Treasury holdings and reserves, essentially cash, from the requirements, the calculation, because they were afraid that banks would pull back on lending because they didn't want to have to set aside more capital or they wouldn't have enough capital. In other words, be able to expand their balance sheet. Now, Fed officials have told us this morning bank balance sheets are in good shape. They have more capital than exposure right now. And so, therefore, they think they can go back to the status quo before COVID. However, reserves have grown so much, much bigger than the Fed anticipated when they passed the exemption last year. They estimate banks have a one, uh, they thought banks would have $1.3 trillion in reserves now. Instead, they have $3.5 trillion. So there's a question about whether the banks would stop taking deposits or stop buying as many treasuries. The fear is that would send cash into the money markets and that would affect repo rates and increase volatility. The Treasury is, I mean, the Fed rather, is uh, going to consider changes to the way the ratio is applied, although they say they will not lower the levels because they figure with more reserves coming all the time, the uh, banks are still going to have this uh, issue of uh, expanding their balance sheets uh, hanging over them for some time. Okay, so this is a perfect explanation for what's going on with the SLR program. Banks have certain holdings between deposits and treasuries, and the rule, the SLR rule that is, required them to have a cushion in their reserves of about 5% or so of their total exposure. Now, this is an exception for covid they lowered the SLR requirement to about 3%, so banks will not be restricted from lending. They wanted banks to help the economic recovery by issuing more loans to businesses and individuals who need those loans. Now, letting the SLR exemption expires will cause some problems. Number one, the reserves, as you heard, ballooned in value, meaning the banks will have to come up with cash to meet the SLR requirement, the original SLR requirement. They could do that, or the easiest way is to stop taking deposits for the ratio to balance out or to start dumping treasuries, which is the easiest way to balance that ratio to meet the requirement. Now, dumping more treasuries by banks is problematic for the market because the problem that we are facing right now is the rise of treasury yields. Well, more dumping from banks will not alleviate the problem. Matter of fact, it will amplify the problem and will push yields higher and higher. Now, banks were not happy with the decision from the Federal Reserve. They want the exemption to continue. Matter of fact, they want the exemption to be permanent because it will allow them to engage in more risky behavior of risky loans and new investments. And we know in the past that the gambling from banks led us to the financial crisis of 08 and 09. And the SLR requirement is part of the regulations to prevent banks from engaging in risky behavior. So banks are not happy. Now, the question is, will they start to send a message by dumping more treasuries along with the vigilantes tag teaming against the Federal Reserve because the outcome of such scenario will be more pain in the bonds market and more gains for treasury yields. Now, I do doubt that banks will act in this manner because when we did the earnings reviews for banks, we looked at the balance sheets and the reserves and say, for example, JP Morgan, they have ample reserves of about $30 billion so they can cover for any requirement whatsoever. Other banks like Wells Fargo, City, it is a little questionable, specifically if you go to smaller banks. Now, the smarty pants over at Wall Street say don't worry about banks dumping treasuries that's not going to happen but once again the easiest way for them to meet the slr ratio and removing the exemptions is by dumping treasuries but the fed has another trick in their tools quote-unquote tools to remedy this problem and it relates to the repo market you heard the guy saying could this morph into the repo market and cause certain disruptions in the repo market which will spill over to the stock market etc etc 
It was the headline, how the repo market could crash stocks in April. And before we start, let's talk about repo a little bit. Repo refers to the repurchasing agreement in the overnight market. For example, if you are a hedge fund and you need cash during the overnight session in the repo market and you offer treasuries as a collateral, Another financial institution will repossess your treasuries for a short amount of time and lend you that cash. The hedge funds use the cash in the overnight session, say pumping the market higher and then dumping when the actual session starts. Now, they made some profits on the cash they received. Now, they have to return the cash and pay the interest to the other financial institution who's now holding their treasuries because they exchange treasuries for cash. They use the cash to make some money in the overnight session. Now, they return the cash plus interest and they repossess their treasuries back. And this is how the repo market works in simple terms. Now, we faced crises before in the repo market. For example, in 2019, the market almost broke because the repo rate shot significantly higher due to a shortage of cash. And the Federal Reserve had to intervene to rescue the repo market. Normally, the repo market is perfectly functioning. You don't need interventions from the Federal Reserve to ensure the functioning of the repo market. But in certain instances, things get out of whack, and if they're not remedied right away, they could spill over to more chaos in the bonds and equities markets. In this case, in 2019, when we saw the massive surge higher because there wasn't enough cash in the repo market, the Federal Reserve remedied that very quickly by injecting more liquidity in the repo market, solving the problem. But we were so close to a market accident in 2019. And a lot of you remember that perfectly. Now, the problem that we're seeing right now in the repo market is the inverse of what happened in 2019. It's not the shortage of cash. The problem this time around is too much cash, meaning that the same hedge funds who are borrowing money overnight in exchange of treasuries no longer need the cash because they have enough cash. Everybody has enough cash. So the other financial institution will offer them cash at negative rate, meaning there is so much cash, they want to get rid of the cash, nobody wants to take cash. So what they're going to say is, hey, hedge fund, take the cash. We will pay you to repossess our cash. Why would they do that? Because there are certain regulatory requirements that they have to live up to. And to balance these requirements, you have to function in the repo market. So in a normal repo market, the hedge fund will take the money and return it back with interest. What is going on right now is that repo rates dip to negative because nobody wants the cash and the other financial institution will have to pay the hedge fund to repossess that cash. Meaning, take our cash and we will pay you interest on top of that. How sweet is this deal? Why would they do that? because they will exchange that cash with treasuries from the hedge fund. That is the repossession agreement. Now, this financial institution, after receiving the treasuries from the hedge fund, will sell the treasuries in the open market and then buy them back at a lower price, returning those treasuries to the hedge funds they borrowed from, plus the interest for holding their money to get it back. All in all, what are they betting on? Think about it as short selling. They are taking the treasuries, selling them in the market for a certain price, and they are betting that those prices for those treasuries will continue to decline rapidly. And then they buy them back for a cheaper price. They return the treasuries to whoever they borrowed them from. In this case, the hedge fund. They repossess their cash back and they pay the interest for the hedge funds for holding their cash. All in all, their bet is that the profit from the decline of the value of treasuries will offset the interest they have to pay the hedge fund for holding their cash. And the result of all of this is pushing repo rates negative. And if this practice continues, we could see another repo crisis. And rates will continue to dip lower and lower and lower negative territory because they want to get their hands on treasuries and dump them in the market right away because they know that the value of treasuries will continue to decline and decline and decline. And once again, treasuries price versus yield, inverse relationship. If the treasury price goes down as these parties are expecting, then that means 
yields will continue to rise higher and higher and higher. And this problem that we are currently in in the market will get even bigger. Now, here is the cute trick that the Federal Reserve is doing to try to remedy this problem. The Fed's staying dovish and doesn't plan on hiking the federal funds rate until after 2023. So stocks are soaring, right? Question mark? Well, not exactly. Yields shot higher again today, and the tech sector sunk in response. Growth stocks abhor high rates, especially when they jump up unexpectedly. Yesterday, the Fed decided to increase the reverse repo RRP counterparty limit, the limit at which a counterparty may make a single bid from 30 billion to 80 billion. It is a seemingly unimportant change, but one that may reverberate through treasuries significantly. Now, let's stop for a moment here and talk about repo versus reverse repo. Essentially, it is the same transaction. If you are offering treasuries, for example, or any collateral in exchange of cash, that is repo. Now, if you are on the other end of the transaction, the one offering cash in exchange of assets, in this case treasuries, that is the reverse repo. In simple terms, of course. So in 2019, we had a repo crisis because there was a shortage of cash. Institutions wanted to trade their treasuries and other assets in exchange of cash. There was a shortage of cash, so the repo rate shot higher, and the Federal Reserve had to intervene and flood the repo market with fresh cash. Now, this time around, we have the reverse repo problem, meaning that we have too much cash in the system. So the remedy here, if the crisis intensify in the reverse repo market and we see the rates continue to trend negatively, what is the Federal Reserve going to do here? Because in the repo crisis, you could just flood the market with money. In the reverse repo problem, you can't just take cash out of the system. So the Federal Reserve has another shoe to drop here on their head. But this is the way they're trying to remedy the problem. By increasing the counterparty limit. Let's see if that is working out or not. So far at least. For those who are not familiar with repo slash reverse repo, each portion represents two part of a transaction. This is exactly what I just explained to you, but maybe you should hear it from the smarty pants. A repo is an agreement between parties where the buyer temporarily purchases a group of securities for a specific period. Then the buyer agrees to sell those same securities back to the original owner at slightly higher price via a reverse repo. It is a way for the Fed to quote unquote mop up excess cash being held by banks so it can control rates easier should it need to. Currently, RRP counterparties invest cash at the Fed in exchange for treasuries at a rate of 0%. The higher RRP counterparty limit, the more cash invested at 0%, thus driving rates down. But is this working or not? By raising the RRP counterparty limit, the Fed opened a channel to 0% or even negative rates. At present, RRPs aren't really happening. There was no RRP activity back on Monday. For example, the increased limit isn't being used. To Credit Suisse, Bond Guru, Sultan, Posar, that could pose a major problem as supplementary leverage ratio SLR relief is set to expire in a few weeks. This is of course at the time of this article was written. Now we know that the SLR relief will let to be expired, something that would spark an epic wave of treasury selling among banks thus spiking yields. So we have the bond vigilantes dumping bonds. We have foreign buyers of bonds not buying as much and also dumping bonds. We have the repo market and they're rushing to short bonds. You have all of these pressures driving yields higher and higher and higher. So is there any option left here for the Federal Reserve to control the rise of yields? In addition, how much pain would the market has to endure before the Federal Reserve interfere? And what would that interference be? Here is from Ray Dalio. The U.S. Federal Reserve will need to buy more bonds as an oversupply of treasuries drives up yields, Ray Dalio says meaning that the Fed has to implement some sort of yield curve manipulation to drive those yields down. 
all in all, this will be a temporary band-aid before yields start to spike up higher again. Why is that? Because the origin of the problem, the rise of inflation expectations, is still going on. Prices of crude higher, prices of lumbar higher, prices of copper higher, aluminum, steel, iron, shipping containers, prices are going higher and that will not stop inflation expectations from rising higher but let's see what ray dalio says about the matter because he's not so optimistic that the federal reserve can get a grip on this problem what we've seen this go around is the need to distribute to produce a lot of debt where did those checks come from they came from the the government the government wrote the checks but the government can't produce money. The central bank can produce money. So they, uh, the central bank had, got, had to print a lot of money to lend to the government um, to do that. And that's monetization. When you get at the late part of that cycle, where you're creating a lot more debt, and then you're monetizing it, that's, the end of a de uh, that's near the end of a long-term debt cycle. And that produces its own set of problems. So what tells us when we're nearing the end of that cycle? I mean, uh, just in recent days, including this week, we've seen the 10-year yield really shoot up. It's still at a modest number historically, but it certainly shot up very quickly. Is it an early warning sign that maybe we've pushed it a bit far on the stimulus yeah. side? Because goodness knows, we've had a lot of stimulus. Yes, I think um, let's understand what's behind that. Um, and then you can understand what the warning signs are because it's just a manifestation. When there has to be a lot of selling of bonds and bonds don't give any good return, there's a guaranteed negative return in bonds relative to inflation. Inflation index bonds yield less minus 1%. And so there's no return. And there's a pile of people who own bonds. And this isn't just Americans, but these are international investors owning bonds. Yeah, wait till China starts dumping bonds and let's see what's going on we're already having tensions with china you might have seen the footage from alaska and all of that so what if the chinese want to turn up the heat a little bit and they start dumping bonds to add more to the misery that the federal reserve has to deal with what happens then and they have to buy a lot more bonds because when the government has to sell a lot more debt that means they have to buy a lot more bonds there will not be enough demand for those bonds. When that happens, interest rates rise, that's what you're seeing now, and the central bank is put in a dilemma. This is all classic end of cycle type of thing. The central bank is put into a dilemma because either interest rates will rise a lot or they will have to print money and buy those bonds to hold them down. When they print money and buy those bonds to hold rate down, that lowers real rates and it accelerates a depreciation of the value of the dollar. Bingo, will the Federal Reserve choose to destroy the reserve currency of the world, the US dollar, to save the bonds market and the equities market? Initially, you'd say, no, they're not. They're not gonna destroy the US dollar to do that. Who cares if the Nasdaq drops another 20%? The Nasdaq is overbought, overvalued with all of these mania names in the technology sector, SPACs, startups, garbage, all overvalued. Isn't it time for the Nasdaq and these names, the speculative names, to get a haircut? And who cares how severe this haircut is going to be? 10%, another 15%, 20%. But here's the problem. If rates continue to rise significantly higher, and we see that the sell-off in the Nasdaq evolving to morph into a bigger sell-off, a broader sell-off, in the Dow, in the S&P 500, energy names, industrials, materials, financials. If that starts to happen, then the Federal Reserve will have no choice but to start buying bonds aggressively once again via Operation Twist. Perhaps that's not going to be sufficient enough and they have to do what the Bank of Australia did and increasing the bond purchasing program specifically in the longer end of the yield curve. There is a price to pay for that, and that price will be the destruction of the U.S. dollar. Continuing with Ray Dalio. And it also um, raises inflation pressures. And what the imbalance, the frightening thing about this, is that if you get um, 
losing money and people are losing money by holding bonds. And that's not just Americans, those are other foreigners. Then they could sell bonds. And if they sell bonds at the same time as the government has got to sell a lot of bonds, that could produce a real dilemma. That's classic late long-term debt cycle type stuff. But the important thing to convey here on inflation is that there are two types of inflation, okay? I just want to make this clear. We're used to one type of inflation, which is when the economy is too hot, um, there's a capacity constraint. And when demand presses up against existing capacity, prices rise. Unemployment rates are low and so forth. There is a thing called a monetary inflation. All right, let's stop here. And I want you to listen carefully. Pay attention to what he's about to say. Specifically for all of you donkeys over at the comment section, the deflationary crowd who keep telling me that a stagflation phenomena is impossible. It would never happen again because of the deflationary forces, bro, yada, 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 all the garbage, the poison that you people been exposed to. I want you to listen carefully to Ray Dalio because he is definitely smarter than you and I combined. That's when you can have stagflation and that monetary inflation means that even when the economy weakens, inflation rates rise because there's too much inflation and there's the move out of that. So you're seeing the move out of bonds and, and cash to move into other assets like stocks and other investment assets, to some extent, stocks, gold, other currencies, Bitcoin and the like. Um, and, but you can start to see a monetary inflation, the real risk, the big risk, is of a monetary inflation, which would come because there would be more sellers of bonds than there are buyers and the need for a lot of printing of money. Now, here is the take. We are now in a market where good economic news equals bad news for the stock market. Why is that? Because I've been saying in this channel over and over again, pretty much since the inception of the channel, that the market has become a cocaine addict. What is the cocaine? Fiscal and monetary liquidity. The market cares less about pandemics, tsunamis, nuclear wars asteroids hitting the planet that doesn't matter so long as the cocaine operation of fiscal and monetary liquidity is intact stonks will continue to go higher take that out of the picture and you have a drug addict of a market that will suffer a withdrawal and what would trigger stopping the flow of cocaine into the market here it is good economic news the fed wants to let inflation run harder because they want an increase in economic activity they want companies to hire more workers they want consumers to go out there and splurge spend like crazy and they are willing to tolerate higher inflation if that will come hand in hand with speeding up the recovery now we know that tolerating higher inflation and an economy in overheat will force the stock market to finally stand on its feet. The nursing of the Federal Reserve of the markets will have to be removed because if the Federal Reserve continues to grease up the market with more cocaine, that will overheat the market, creating a massive bubble which will pop and create another economic crisis, the likes that we saw back in the financial crisis of 08 or 09. So now that we are finally seeing the economy seeing the light at the end of the tunnel from the COVID crisis and inflation finally picking up after years and years of being dormant, now the market has a challenge to stand up on its feet. And we know with these current valuations, the market has no legs to stand on. And the market will have to suffer significant losses before it reaches equilibrium and it is able to stand on its feet naturally. And that brings up the conversation once again. How much pain can the market endure and the Fed turning the blind eye? What is the inflection point where the Federal Reserve has to intervene? And why would they intervene? Because it is a balance between saving the economy and saving the market. You gotta choose one or the other. Do you wanna save the economy? Then you gotta sacrifice the market and let the market correct naturally and stand up on its feet. The other choice is to save the market. Why would you do that? and risk crushing the economic recovery. The Federal Reserve, once again, is between a rock and a hard place. But one thing that changed for good right now 
is that good news regarding the economy is bad news for the market. And here is from economist Mohammed Alarian, and this time around Mohammed managed to find his suit and did not show up in his pajamas. Reaction this morning, please. So now we understand why Chair Powell wanted to separate the SLR decision from the monetary policy decision, because they could have been viewed as contradictory. I don't think they are, but I listened carefully to what Priya said. John, I think the bigger issue here is, is that the economic paradigm is changing, and the Fed doesn't want to change too much the policy paradigm. So while this is a, a change, it's such a small change, the bigger issues remain. And the reason why is because it doesn't want to disrupt the liquidity paradigm. So well, when we look forward, whether it's end of quarter or beyond, the question is, how do you reconcile the economic paradigm changes with policy and liquidity? And that's what the market is trying to figure out right now. Mohammed, when you refer to the liquidity paradigm, can you tell us in more detail what you are referring to and the reason you're so concerned about it at the moment? It's what you said earlier today um, when you were on with Tom, which is, have you noticed that good news for the economy has turned out to be bad news for the markets? And it's a complete reverse of last year. And what reconciles all this is that bad news for the economy meant ample and predictable liquidity injections by central banks around the world. Now we're seeing increased dispersion among central banks around the world. And that is undermining what has been a very comforting liquidity paradigm. So that's why you've noticed and others have noticed that good economic news has become bad news for markets. And the transmission mechanism is the liquidity paradigm. There's less confidence in the robustness of a liquidity paradigm that has been incredibly helpful for assets. Just how cornered are central banks right now, Mohammed? We've seen the move from Brazil, Turkey this week, Russia, maybe more to come from the Russian central bank. And a Fed just willing to stay on hold, even with the numbers they're forecasting into 2023, a Fed that is willing just to look through it, sit tight and not do anything with interest rates. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be harder to sustain. They're not going to be able to sustain that position. I think that even at 6.5%, they are still not incorporating fully the bounce we're going to get in this economy as long as we don't uh, mess up with, with the COVID battle. So I'm looking at 7% plus for growth this year. Um, it, it is an open question whether inflation will indeed be transitory. Um, but I understand why they are hesitant to change their forward guidance. So I think they're going to be at some point find, find themselves in an even tougher corner. And the hope we all have, John, and it's a really important hope, is that we get a second pro-recovery fiscal package that allows for that handoff that we've been waiting for for such a long time from excessive reliance on unconventional monetary policies. Okay, so he is talking about this handoff between the market relying on monetary support versus the market relying on its own merit. The question is, does the market have any legs to stand on? Because... The justification of these insane valuations in the stock market that we see today was due to but 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 the Fed but 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 the monetary liquidity but 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 the cocaine bro well that's gone now it's gonna be gone there is no choice so how do we prepare for a new era in the market where stocks have to stand on their own number one they're gonna have a massive correction of all of the overvaluation and the excesses in the market number two you're going to shift into stock picking mode. The lazy era of investing, picking ETFs, picking a technology stock out of a hat, that's over. You got to pick your stocks strategically. And we will see certain stocks and certain sectors of the market benefiting tremendously from the inflationary environment and the rise of consumer spending, government spending, etc. But that shift will be very hard to adjust to specifically for newer investors who've been accustomed to investing in technology stocks, believing in the future, etc., etc. Technology and growth stocks will still have a place in every portfolio in the market, but you have to be picky. You have to choose your names carefully. Anyways, I had a lot of sentiment news prepared for you. We were going to talk about ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, new target for Tesla. We were going to talk about lots of other market indicators regarding sentiment. 
And I also prepared for you some corporate specific news specifically regarding the souffle, Tesla. We have a lot of news regarding China and Tesla and what's going on over there. But for the interest of time, because I'd like to keep these videos under one hour, we will skip all of that and cover those during tomorrow's episode instead. For now, we're moving on to the heat map analysis and let's see what happened during last week. Right away, you can see that we are seeing pain across the board and the sell-off in the Nasdaq is starting to become a little contagious. The notable take here is the sell-off in energy stocks. We saw massive declines for Exxon, Chevron, British Petroleum, the entire energy sector got it on the head this week due to the massive declines we saw in crude oil prices during Thursday's session. Now, I do believe that the sell-off in energy stocks is to buy, but you gotta let it run its course first. We also saw notable weakness here in materials, in addition to weakness in the financial sector, specifically on Friday's session, after the decision of letting the SLR exemptions expire. Now, I don't believe that this is a cause for concern specifically for banks, because if anything, the dip is to buy specifically in financials. Forget about energy. Financials have become the safest place to park in this market, at least for now. Because while many will see the SLR exemption expiration as bad news for banks, here is the reality. And this is from CNN Business. Here come the buybacks, question mark. Although bank stocks fell on the news Friday, we're talking about the SLR expiration, the exemption expiration. There could be a silver lining for Wall Street. Allowing the relief to expire could ease pressure on the Fed to limit bank dividends and share buybacks. This takes out of play the biggest political impediment to the Fed removing all COVID-19 related restrictions on big bank capital distributions. So once again, am I putting my blindfold on and running Naruto style buying the dip in financials? Not at all. I already have exposure to the financial sector, but if I continue to see financials selling off, meanwhile yields continue to rise higher, that would be an opportunity to buy because nothing changed regarding the macro outlook. Either the Fed is going to do some yield curve manipulation and that would be the moment to sell banks, or we will only see a temporary relief in the bonds market, let's say in the rebalancing that's about to come this upcoming week and we see more buying of bonds and the stimmy money buying the dip in technology and the high momentum high growth names that would be an opportunity to start writing a list in the inflationary trade specifically in financials to buy some of these names because once again once the stimmy impact wears off once the rebalancing is over what do we have the same conditions dumping of bonds inflation expectations rising higher meaning that yields will continue to go higher and higher and that is very good for financials, the steepening of the curve is extremely good for banks. What else can we see in this heat map? Right away, you can see that the technology sector is still not getting any relief whatsoever. But we saw a rebound in certain names. And these names happen to be the value names within technology. We are talking about the semiconductor names, specifically Broadcom. Broadcom up over 5% this week. Broadcom happens to be one of the value names within technology. Micron is another name up over 3% for the week. Intel, another one up over 1.3%. You also have Qualcomm finishing in the green. You get the classic value names, IBM, for example, finishing the week with gains a little over 1%. And these are the names that will continue to outperform within the technology sector. So some people are saying, dump the technology trade altogether. That is not wise because there are names to choose from within the technology sector. Contrast that with the pain we saw in names like Square, down over 7%, Palantir, down almost 10%, Okta, down almost 6%, Coupa Software, down over 10%. You get the picture. The mania names are not getting rewarded. The mania names are getting a haircut because they deserve one when you have yields rising higher and these names like Palantir for example is valued based on future earnings. Well the present value of these future earnings even if they are true by the way assuming that the hype is true and the company will generate 10 billion dollars someday that doesn't matter because even if you count that the present value of those future earnings get diluted every time yields continue to rise higher. 
Now, let's address the ad performance from Facebook, for example. Facebook finished the week over 8%. Meanwhile, we saw declines in Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, all the fang names, exception Facebook. What is going on with Facebook and why is it at performing? I have a theory for you. Here is the price to book heat map for the entire market. Facebook at 6.45, Apple at 30.69, Microsoft 13, Amazon about 16, Netflix 20. So among the FANG names, Google and Facebook are the value names. Likewise, when we look at the peg ratio heat map, which factors in growth when we talk about the PE ratio. A lot of people don't like PEs because PE ratios are lagging and they don't factor for growth. So the peg ratio is very important here because it factors in growth. And when we look at the big technology names, the FANG names, Facebook at 1.34, signaling that Facebook is the cheapest name here when you pin it against Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, even Google. Facebook is the best deal in the FANG names. But here's the problem. I wouldn't buy Facebook right now because of the ETFization effect in the market, meaning that if we see yields continue to rise and the NASDAQ gets dumped again, and we see a sell-off in Apple, Microsoft, Google, etc., Facebook will get hurt too due to the ETFization impact. So I wouldn't touch it right now, but you are seeing that the market is being very intelligent in choosing and picking the names to punish and the names to reward. Moving on to the themes analysis, starting with the nostalgia stocks, aka the reopening stocks. Let's see what's going on here. Mostly declines across the board, very modest gains, with exception to the main name of AMC. That's another YOLO stock that could continue to rally, by the way, due to the STEMI impact. But all in all, we're seeing that the reopening trade starting to cool off. And once again, I am starting to write up a list for names to short within the reopening trade because I believe that we will see sell the news phenomena once we start reopening the economy for good. Number two, a lot of these names are becoming very overvalued. And we know that we have a problem in the market right now regarding overvaluation. Names that are overvalued are being punished. Add to that the fact that these companies are highly leveraged. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And if rates continue to rise higher, there is a threshold when the pain will start to be inflicted against these names, specifically the zombie names within the reopening trade. Moving on to the inflationary trade. What's going on here? Mixed picture. We saw some gains, some losses. But the clear take here is that the inflationary trade is not outperforming significantly as it was the last few weeks. This week, we saw some profit taking. And the question, the million dollars question that is, are they just waiting for a dip to deploy the cash again in the same names? I'm buying the inflationary trade or is there another plan to deploy the cash and is that plan to buy the deflationary stocks losses across the board they're not as severe as the picture was the last few weeks but still notable we have declines of over seven percent in square about five percent in doordash over five percent in tesla over five percent in okta almost seven percent in snapchat you get the picture the hope for these names is a temporary relief in the rise in yields and a tsunami of STEMI money buying the dip. Moving on to the charts analysis, starting with the SPY, 15 minutes chart. Once again, we broke in the series of higher lows. That was your signal right there that this upward trend in the SPY is over. And right away, you see us gapping lower on Friday and getting rejected from 391, meaning that the trajectory is lower, not higher in the SPY. This is at least what the technicals are saying from a 15 minutes perspective. Moving on to the daily chart, the continuous contract of the SPY. What's going on here? We got rejected from the very important level, 3,960. And now we have somewhat of a double top. That will be confirmed. If we pierce below the very important support level of 3,862, that is the number to watch. And if we crack below this number, then rest assured that the double top scenario is taking place and we have lower prices to visit in the SPY. And what about the weekly chart for the cash index, the SPX? And the point to illustrate here is that we are still facing the very hard resistance that you see in the trend line. And we are already curling down from an RSI and MACD perspective 
signaling weakening in the momentum. The expectations are that we will see lower prices and a correction in the SPY, meaning that you could see weakness in the so-called cyclical and inflationary trade. Consumer defensives, financials, energy, materials, industrials, healthcare, etc. When will the negative picture go down the toilet? When we crack above the resistance line in yellow and we manage to close above it from a weekly perspective. And then we will have the all clear signal. Moving on to the cues. 15 minutes chart. We're back at 313. We are struggling back and forth. This is the center of gravity of the chart. And it is not looking so good here. Of course, we have many dynamics beside the technicals that will dictate the trajectory for the cues. Chiefly, the impact of rebalancing on yields. And number two, the stimmy impact. I happen to believe, and this is between me and you, by the way, and the thousands of other people who can access this video. But I do believe that the stimmy impact is being over exaggerated, meaning that not all of the $150 billion in stimmy money that is planned to enter the market will enter at once. Some people will wait for a better entry opportunity. Some will go all in Naruto style buying call options and they could get burned. It is not necessary just because we're seeing a tsunami of stimmy money that we will see the market going higher. It depends on the deployment are they going to deploy it all at once which sectors of the market etc etc meaning that you could see sizable impact in certain names such as say GameStop AMC the YOLO names if they flood these names with a tsunami of call options they will create a gamma squeeze and these names will surge higher. Now, it is a lot difficult to create a gamma squeeze in, say, Apple or Tesla or the NASDAQ as a whole if the institutions are selling and dumping shares. So once again, I think that the STEMI impact is being over-exaggerated, but it will have an impact in certain corners of the market. Anyways, back to the cues. What do we see here? 313 remains the support level that has to be defended. You gotta keep 313 if you're gonna bounce higher. Breaching below 313 will mean more pain to come. But we're not just talking about the next support level of 308 and a half. We're talking well below that. Moving on to the continuous contract. What do we see here? Daily perspective. My goal was for the queues to reach all the way to the purple trend line and break above it. That didn't happen. They tried once, twice, and the third time it was a harsh rejection. And this is a reversal candle, a classic reversal candle. A big one and it is indicating that there are lower prices for the queues you're not going to start being bullish again until you close above this candle from a weekly perspective and you recapture the purple trend line other than that i don't care about the bounces we could see from a day-to-day -day perspective if you don't close above that reversal candle there are lower prices to visit and what about the iwm 15 minutes perspective we talked about the double top formation that led us to a massive flush down breaking below the trading channel and now we have somewhat of a bull flag formation from a 15 minutes perspective which is supposed to take us all the way to challenge the lower end of the channel but there is something i want to illustrate for you from a technical analysis perspective because the 15 minutes chart, the shorter end chart, you can look at this as a bull flag formation, which could indeed lead us higher. But when you zoom out to a 30 minutes perspective, what does this look like for you? A bear flag formation, meaning that the bull flag in the 15 minutes chart could indeed play out to the upside, but that wouldn't change the bigger outlook of the bear flag. The longer charts have more control and power to dictate the outcome of the next move, not the shorter charts. So once again, don't be surprised if you see the IWM higher and the bull flag from a 15 minutes perspective playing out. But that doesn't negate the bear flag that is forming from a 30 minutes perspective until and unless you close above half of the body of the pole. And that would be around 230 in or around this number zooming out to the daily chart let's see what's going on here we have broken the series of higher lows and now we're just waiting to break the series of higher highs once that is confirmed then the iwm is toast moving on to the dollar index what do we see here the dixie we have a similar story here with the dixie 
of higher highs and higher lows. Unless you negate this formation by creating lower highs or lower lows, the trend remains upward. Furthermore, we talked about the consolidation below a certain resistance level. Not just in the Dixie, but in any chart. If you are consolidating just below a certain resistance level, you are gathering energy to break above it. Moving on to gold. What do we see here in gold? Gold managed to do a mini rebound from 1675, even though the Dixie managed to rise higher and yields continued to rise higher. Now wait for it. Bitcoin also managed to close a little higher. It was trading back and forth in a flattish manner. We will take a look at the BTC chart in a little bit. But that tells you that gold reach oversold conditions and it is becoming attractive at least for certain traders who may be buying gold for a trade. They'll dump it at 1765 or whatever the number traders are looking for. But once again, gold is dictated by the dollar index, treasury yields, and Bitcoin. If these three go higher, gold goes lower. Gold thrives if we see the dollar index down, yields down, and Bitcoin down. If these three go down together, then this is the golden environment for gold. Now, the question is, and we have to revisit this from time to time, why is gold trading lower when inflation expectations are rising higher? The answer is that golds tend to outperform in the later stages of inflation when the dollar index starts to suffer. We saw that back in the 70s, and we could see it again. But for now, in the initial stages of rising inflation, gold could be an underperformer. Here is a weekly chart, the Fibonacci retracement levels of gold. We are bouncing back from 1676, 1675, doesn't matter, close enough. And the next destination here for the rally to continue is 1815. Let's be conservative and say 1800. So gold could rally all the way to 1800, but it is a long shot if the dollar and yields continue to rise. So here is what you have to watch for. Number one, if gold trades higher, expect a massive resistance at 1800. And perhaps this is a point where you want to make a decision to take profits. And when do you abandon the trade, assuming that you bought the dip at 1675? If we start dipping below 1675, then this is your indicator to abandon the ship because lower prices are coming for gold. And we are talking about declines all the way below 1600. So you don't want to be catching a falling knife here. You'll abandon the trade if we start to close below 1675. Moving on to Bitcoin, what do we see here? Nothing changed. The series of higher highs and higher lows remains intact. And unless you start making lower lows, or lower highs, then we will start looking for a reversal. Now, let's play the devil's advocate here in Bitcoin. What if I told you that perhaps this formation is a bear flag that could lead us lower? This is what you have to watch for if you are long Bitcoin. You don't want to see this leg starting to play lower because if the bear flag plays to the downside, then you will start making lower highs and that is the signal that a reversal is shaping up in Bitcoin. Moving on to the TNX, the 10-year Treasury yield. And we nailed this chart from the very beginning, from the breakout to the ABC pattern to the series of bull flags. And now what do we see? Nothing is going on here. The breakout goes on. There is no weakness in momentum whatsoever in the rise of Treasury yields. And unless we see a clear reversal candle, a clear reversal signal, the trajectory remains higher. Moving on to the TLT, the prices of bonds. Let's see what's going on here. This is a weekly chart. We have support at 135 and a half. We managed to close above that. The challenge here is, is this a solid support? Because if it is broken, then we have 128 to look forward to. So you gotta watch 134 and a half at the TLT. And if we start bouncing above that, forming a bottom, that could have many implications, even if it is a short term bottom. Because a bottoming process in the TLT will mean a revival of the technology growth trade and an end to the winning streak for the inflationary trade of financials, industrials, materials, energy. So if you must watch one chart during this upcoming week, it should be the TLT. And you'll be watching the level of 134.5 
very closely. Moving on to the VIX, what do we see here? Well, the VIX pulled out a bull trap by closing below 20. And a lot of people thought that this is a signal to go along the SPY and buy stocks because it is a signal that volatility is about to diminish. On the contrary, and we said that once the VIX dips below 20, we will be buyers of the VIX. And right away, you saw the snapback shooting higher. If the VIX wanted to close below 20 and trend lower, it would have done that a long time ago, but the VIX always had a higher destination to visit. What we saw on Thursday is the pop higher. On Friday, we had a confirmation of holding the level of 20 for support. The VIX is not ready to close below 20 yet. There are higher prices for the VIX and perhaps we will see more appreciation in the volatility index if we continue to see a sell-off in financials, energy, materials, industrials, consumer defensives because the VIX will appreciate higher if we see the SPY diving lower, not just the NASDAQ or the technology stocks. The VIX is tracking the entire S&P 500. Moving on to Apple, what do we see here? Daily chart, not looking good. You were supposed to close above 120. They pulled this trick and closed at 19, excuse me, 119.99, one cent short. This is not a satisfactory close whatsoever. And let's visit the weekly chart. We have this reverse hammer candle going on, suggesting that what we're seeing all together in the weekly chart perspective is a bear flag formation and we are supposed to crack lower so i told you you should watch tlt 134 and a half here's the other chart that you have to watch apple 120 if apple doesn't even bother trying to recapture 120 then we got a problem here in the nasdaq and remember as apple goes so will the nasdaq Moving on to Tesla, what do we see here? Fibonacci perspective first, we dived lower during Friday's activities, yet we managed to capture the support of the Fibonacci level of 623 and a half, and we managed to close well above the lows. Now, what do you do with this chart just looking at the Fibonacci perspective? There is no more information to read. You'll be watching two numbers, 679 once again. That number must be recaptured for any bullish outlook for Tesla. And number two, and this is the ultimatum, Tesla should not break 623 and a half because doing so will signal lower prices to come, much lower prices. Now, you might say, oh, but the stimmy money and the enthusiasm to buy the dip in Tesla, Kathy Wood came out with a new price target, yada, yada, yada. Is there a bullish outlook from a technical perspective for Tesla? Yes, there is. Here it is. The bullish case. Are we seeing a reverse head and shoulder formation that should take us higher? You know the threshold, 679. Closing above that number, my daily chart perspective will pave the way for the reverse head and shoulder formation. But the problem is, and here is the bear case against Tesla. A weekly chart perspective, a more significant chart. The weekly chart holds more weight than the daily one. And the question is, we are still seeing an ABC formation that abc formation will lead us to lower prices and perhaps we will stop around the levels of 400 or so so once again a daily bounce could be on the books if we see tesla closing above 679 because the reverse head and shoulder formation will take place however the question is how high will the reverse head and shoulder formation assuming that it will play take us we have a reversal candle from a weekly perspective the highs of that candle is 7.68.5. Can you close above that number from a weekly perspective? And if you can, we're talking about Tesla's chart, of course, then the outlook will turn from bearish to bullish. But for now, you know what to watch for. Are you going to break above 6.79 or not? Closing above 6.79 from a daily perspective will pave a way for more gains. Failing to close above 6.79 and more importantly, breaking 623 and a half will pave the way for more pain a lot more so you got two numbers to watch out for moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have in the economic calendar this upcoming week we don't have anything of importance until wednesday wednesday we have the manufacturing pmi and then on thursday per usual we have the weekly jobless claims and lastly on friday we have 
personal income, consumer spending, core inflation, and consumer sentiment. These will be very, very important, specifically regarding core inflation. Now, let's finish with this article from Barron's. And mind you, of course, Barron's is a propaganda piece for Wall Street. But here it is, talking about bond vigilantes. And can bond vigilantes repeat their performance from the 80s when they created the biggest stock market crash in history. The Fed will probably head them off at the pass, as a rise in yields probably will be temporary. Also, why this coming week could be good for the fixed income market. For the near term, the trend in yields remains up, at least on a technical basis. Peter, whatever his name is, the head of macro strategy at Academy Securities, sees a further rise to 1.87% of the 10-year yield, which would put it near where it traded in late 2019, before the world was turned upside down. A move to 2.10% is a realistic target, he writes in a client note, but a break above that could lead to a jump to the 2.5% range, where the benchmark note stood two years ago. But that would probably qualify as a quote-unquote disorderly move that could elicit a reaction from the Fed, he adds. So now they're looking to 2.5% before the Federal Reserve reacts. Continuing, the most proximate trigger would probably be a full-fledged equity bear market. That has been the history of recent decades, most notably on Black Monday, October 19, 1987, when a rapid rise in long-term treasury yields to 10% collided with a richly valued market trading at over 20 times expected earnings, resulting in a record 22% one-day plunge in the Dow. And this is precisely the problem. The Fed changed its course from a proactive Fed to a reactive Fed, meaning that the Federal Reserve will wait for disaster before intervening. So should we have another Black Monday before the Federal Reserve gets the memo? And even if they get the memo, what is the solution here? There is no solution but to let the correction take its course and cross your fingers that it will not be contagious outside of the technology and high growth names. And here's the last bit of this article. This coming week could see a reversal of fortunes, albeit temporary, between the bond and stock markets. As institutional investors rebalance their portfolios ahead of the end of the first quarter, corporate defined benefit pension funds will move about $28 billion into fixed income securities, the biggest inflow since 2009, according to an estimate by Wells Fargo. In addition to, here it is, while institutions reshuffle portfolios. It will be interesting to see what individuals do with their 1400 bucks stimulus payments. Some $242 billion was deposited into Americans' bank accounts on Wednesday, the biggest quote-unquote helicopter drop to date. At the same time, Bank of America strategists point out a quote-unquote staggering record $68.3 billion dollars flowed into equity funds in the past week. It seems that at least some of the stimulus may be going for speculation rather than spending. Surprise, surprise. So these, once again, the two dynamics we're watching for. Number one, the portfolio rebalancing. How would that impact treasury yields? Number two, the stimmy checks. How will they be spent? You want my opinion? Here it is. I'm not going to hype the stimulus checks at all. Any pop in the market will be temporary until and unless the Federal Reserve takes action to prevent yields from rising higher. Absent of that, we'll continue to follow the same playbook. Buy the dips in financials, energy, industrials, materials. Don't go right away in Naruto style, heads first, blindfolds on. Wait a few days till you get a reversal signal on the technicals. Number two, you fade the rallies in the media names. Tesla, Palantir, Plug Power. But once again, don't put your blindfold on running Naruto style buying puts. Wait till you see a reversal signal from a technical basis because these things take a few days, sometimes weeks, to run their full course. Anyways, I hope that this video was helpful to you, and if it was, press the like button, 
Make sure you subscribe and add more to the conversation by commenting your input. That's all I got for you tonight, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally.